so we have one more for you this evening. The uh, the founder of this establishment here at the open mic, Steve Cabin. Hi. Uh, I'm going to read you a story from a book I wrote. When I was 18 years old, I, um, I hitchhiked around the world. It took me four years, two years in North America and two years in the rest. And I wrote it all down in a book. I happen to have copies for sale, $10 each. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I got halfway around, I headed north uh, to Russia. And it happened to be January when I got there. And uh, so this is my adventure in uh, eastern Siberia at minus 38 degrees. What year? 1977. Chapter 54, Khabarovsk. When I applied for a visa in Tokyo to visit the Soviet Union, the Russian embassy was very clear. Before you can visit Russia, you must tell us exactly where you will go and where you will stay. I told them I had no idea. That was not a problem. They told me where I would go and where I would stay. After some discussion, I had a 40-day itinerary for a trip across the Soviet Union east to west, mostly aboard the Trans-Siberian Railway. A month later, we sailed from Hong Kong to Yokohama and on to Nakhodka. Nakhodka is where they send you uh, because tourists are not allowed to land at Vladivostok, a naval base of considerable size and strategic importance. At Nakhodka, we boarded a train. Several hours later, we were checked into our rooms at the Inn Tourist Hotel in Habrovsk, uh, across the Amur River from the Chinese border. Tourists were not allowed to wander around in Russia unsupervised in those days. Every morning, a woman the size and shape of a large refrigerator would appear in the lobby with a white glove and an umbrella to guide us toward the official sites and tell us what we were seeing. We discovered that if we lined up like penguins and walked toward the bus, that we could veer off at the last minute and disappear into the crowd with no uh, adverse consequences. Thus, we achieved the freedom of the whole town. Bill and I had purchased winter clothing at the Chinese National Store in Hong Kong, but my hands were cold. January in Siberia is something to be experienced in person. Anyway, we proceeded to look for a store where I could find some gloves. On the way there, I met a young university student, Oleg Fyutovich. He spoke English and offered to help me translate at the store. In American stores, the goal is efficiency. In Soviet stores, the goal is 100% employment. To achieve this, the store was arranged in a way that would take one job and spread it among as many persons as possible. I got in line at outdoor wear and waited patiently for my turn. After about 20 minutes, I reached the counter and asked the young woman to show me the selection of gloves. They had exactly one style, three sizes, small, medium, and large. All black. I picked out a pair and was handed a small ticket. The ticket had a code for the gloves I wanted printed on it. I then lined up again at the cashier. After about 20 minutes, I got to the register and paid my two and a half rubles. She gave me a receipt, again with the name and model and quantity on it. I lined up at a counter in front of two doors that led to the storeroom. After about 20 minutes, I handed my receipt to the woman at the counter and she disappeared for a time, returning with a pair of large black gloves. She handed them over, marked my receipt, and Oleg and I stepped out into the snow. Oleg walked with me to the Amur River and we strolled along the ice. He asked me questions about America and I asked him about Habarovsk. I saw some fellows ice fishing on the river and it reminded me of home. We were so engaged in conversation I failed to look down at a critical moment and stepped into an ice fishing hole that had not yet frozen over. My whole leg went in right up to the hip. Oleg helped pull me out and I shook my leg vigorously. Come to my house, he said. We'll warm you up and you can have some lunch as well. I agreed and we strolled, strolled off into town. After we had walked for about 10 minutes, I stopped and looked at my leg. I was wearing wool pants and the wet pant leg had now frozen solid, resembling an aluminum downspout. 
Oleg bent down and whacked his hands along my leg, knocking all the ice off. The pants were now dry again and quite comfortable. Oleg lived in it with his mother in a tiny two-bedroom apartment on the third floor of an eight-story apartment building. His mother was a physician, and, she, and he introduced me, and we settled down in the living room to talk. She brought us each a bowl of borscht, a beet soup. It was red and hot and had a dollop of sour cream in the middle. We ate caviar spread on crackers and talked a little about their lives in Habrovsk. I really didn't like caviar, but munched appreciative, appreciatively and told him stories of my adventures. When I found out that Oleg knew about how to play a guitar, I invited him to join Bill and I that evening after supper for vodka and folk singing at the Inn Tourist Hotel. Traveler's note number 65, hospitality. People love to show you hospitality and they especially like to feed you. Eat what you are given, accept it in a spirit of grateful appreciation no matter what it tastes like. Smile. That evening about eight or so Oleg showed up in the lobby and Bill and I invited him into our room. We had purchased several bottles of vodka at the tourist store and took turns playing and singing and drinking. It was great. The following morning I awoke around dawn. My head throbbed, the inside of my mouth was all glued together and there was dried vomit on my chest. Oleg and most of our clothes were gone. I turned and shook Bill awake. Bill, I shouted, we've been robbed. Da, said Bill. Oleg is gone. He took our most of our clothes, including my winter coat. Da, said Bill. I'm going downstairs to report this, I said. Da, says Bill. I put on Oleg's coat, which made me look ridiculous since I was half a foot taller and 50 pounds heavier than he was. I stumbled, stumbled to the elevator and rang the bell at the front desk. When the concierge came to the desk, I tried to explain what had happened. I was having trouble, particularly because everything was so blurred and partly because my mouth wasn't working very well. I finally managed to explain that I'd been robbed. The desk clerk made a phone call. And in a short time, two huge lean men in gray coats and furry caps arrived in the police jeep. They were KGB. We went for a ride together in the gray dawn, the crisp snow crunching under the wheels as we rolled to a stop outside Oleg's apartment building. They got out, walked straight to the front door, and banged hard on the doors while barking something sharp in Russian. Every light in the building came on. We went in. Oleg's room was waiting. Oh, sorry, Oleg's mom was waiting at the door to her apartment and she showed the men in. They quickly searched the apartment and when Oleg was nowhere to be found, they drove me back to the hotel. As we were leaving, I noticed Oleg's shoes on the doormat, but I didn't say anything. Robbery or not, we were on a schedule. The staff collected Bill and I and what remained of our belongings. The KGB drove us to the train station and escorted us to our cabin on the train for Irkutsk. I told Bill we were going to Irkutsk. Da, said Bill. It would be three days before we began to start, sort out what had happened to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you for performing. Come on back next Monday, we'll do it again. And we'll see you, we'll see you, Madison. Good night.